Hello, everyone. Welcome to the virtual panel event for Decoding Your Cat. The ultimate experts explain common cat behaviors and reveal how to prevent or change unwanted ones presented by Bookshop. I'm Angela Januzzi. I work with marketing and special programs like this one here now at Bookshop. And I'm going to give a brief intro here while we wait for the audience uh, members to join us for a few minutes. Then we'll go through previously submitted questions with our panelist authors from the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. And then about 20 to 30 minutes in, we will take live questions from the audience using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So let's just take a moment here to get situated and I'm going to tell you a little bit about Bookshop and then we'll introduce our very talented, accomplished author experts here. So again, please note questions may be vetted in real time. Uh, we're going to try to answer as many as possible, but it's not likely they will all be able to be answered. So thank you for understanding that too. And just a reminder, this event is being recorded. Uh, it's available on replay soon in the future. Uh, so stay tuned on Bookshop's platforms and where you'll be able to find it, most likely YouTube. First, a word about Bookshop. Every book purchase you make on Bookshop directly supports independent and local bookstores. Bookshop is an online bookstore with a mission to financially support local independent bookstores because we believe that bookstores are essential to a healthy culture. They're where authors can connect with readers, where we discover new writers, and where children get hooked on the thrill of reading that can last a lifetime. They're also anchors for our downtowns and for our communities. As more and more people buy their books online, we wanted to create an easy, convenient way for you to get your books and support bookstores at the same time. If you want to find a specific bookstore to support, you can find them on our map on our website, bookshop.org, and that store will receive full profit from your order. Otherwise, your order will contribute to an earnings pool that will evenly be distributed among independent bookstores, even those that don't use Bookshop. We also support anyone who advocates for books through our affiliate program, which pays 10% commission on every sale and gives a matching 10% to independent bookstores. If you are an author, if your website or a magazine, if you have a book club, if you're an organization that wants to recommend books, or even if you're just a book lover with an Instagram feed or without an Instagram feed, <laughs> you can sign up to be an affiliate for free, start your own shop and be rewarded for your advocacy of books. Bookshop wants to give back to everyone who promotes books and authors and independent bookstores. By design, we give away 75% of our profit margin to stores, publications, authors, and others who make a th the thriving inspirational culture around books. So we're proud to partner, especially with those stores whose e-commerce capacity and our inventory space, we can help supplement so they may better succeed too. We hope that Bookshop can help strengthen the fragile ecosystem and margins around book selling and keep local bookstores an integral part of our culture and our communities. Bookshop is a B Corp, a corporation dedicated to public good. So now for our introduction of our accomplished guest today, the reason you're all here. <laughs> we have over 800 registrants for this event today. So the topic of uh, better understanding the cats with whom people share their households is clearly one that resonates very heavily and especially now uh, during historic quarantine at home. And finally, on a very quick personal note, I'm not sure she's here watching. My mom may be uh, one of the attendees today uh, whose birthday it happens to be. And who allowed my sister and I to have not one, not two, but three cats during our time growing up, um, much to the thrill of my father. So we just wanna say a uh, happy birthday, mom. So moving on, without further ado, let's introduce our talented expert veterinary behaviorists, authors and contributors to Decoding Your Cat out of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, which you can purchase on bookshop.org. Uh, on the webpage we will share at the end of this event and in the thank you email to all live attendees today too. Believe it or not, the bios I'm about to read you about these experts are actually shortened. <laughs> that is how accomplished these panelists are today with us. So here are the abbreviated versions and it is still a lot of impressive background. <laughs> Dr. Megan Heron is the Senior Director of Behavioral Medicine, Education and Outreach at GG's, a shelter organization dedicated to improving the lives of shelter dogs. She has been Associate Professor in the Department of Veterinary Clinical Sciences as Head of the Behavioral Medicine Service at The Ohio State University Veterinary Medical Center, also where she graduated. She became board certified as diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Behavior after completing a residency at the University of Pennsylvania School of Veterinary Medicine. As a published author and international speaker, she is the lead author of the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists ACVB book, Decoding Your Cat, which we're discussing today. 
Dr. Kelly Ballantyne is a board certified veterinary behaviorist and leader of the Insight Animal Behavior Services in Chicago. She worked at the University of Illinois Chicago College of Veterinary Medicine for 10 years, establishing the college's first behavior service. Dr. Ballantyne's research interests include human animal interactions and psychopharmacology. And Dr. Lonnie Sung obtained her master's degree and doctorate in psychology with a special interest in animal behavior from the University of Georgia and her doctorate in veterinary medicine from the University of Georgia College of Veterinary Medicine, then board certification in veterinary behavioral medicine. <laughs> This is also impressive. Dr. Sung currently provides consultations at the Behavior Specialty Clinic located at the San Francisco SPCA. Dr. Sung also contributes to the management and treatment of behavioral needs for the shelter pets at San Francisco SPCA. She is also co-author of the book From Fearful to Fear Free, in addition to contributing to Decoding Your Cat here today. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you all for making it through that intro. We already have a lot of questions, so let's begin with the basics uh, from of the book, and then we'll go into previously submitted questions, and then we're hoping we can open it up to the audience Q&A, again, using the below Q&A icon, audience members, uh, in about 20 to 30 minutes. So if that's okay for everyone, please uh, unmute your <laughs> microphones. Let's get started. Thank you all again for being here. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So let's start with our very first pre-submitted question, if that works. If someone is thinking of adopting or buying a cat, basics, what are some things they should keep in mind for making this commitment? I can start if you want. Um, I feel like we get asked this question all the time. And um, what kind of pet should I get? And how about a cat? Cats are easy, right? I don't have to walk it. It's going to be super low maintenance, just a little couch potato. And I just want to say buyer beware. <laughs> um, cats, cats are much higher maintenance than we give them credit for. That said, if you provide and plan appropriately for them, it can be a joy and not feel like work at all. Just keep in mind that cats have a lot of normal natural behaviors that can become a nuisance. Um, you know, when we look at our today's cat, it's very similar to its wild counterpart, both in looks and behavior. So we just need to remember that we got to set up a lifestyle that's conducive to that. So hunting, scratching, chewing are all normal cat behaviors. So be prepared to provide outlets for that so that it doesn't become your couch that's destroyed and all of your household plants that are torn to pieces and um, your laundry basket or your potted plants that are becoming a toilet for them. <laughs> but I think it's one of the motivators for our writing this book um, <laughs> is that we want to really provide a guidebook um, for e anyone who's already a cat lover or if you're cat curious it it's really a, a way to make it so it's a joy and not um, hard work or high maintenance yeah if you if you read our book you've been well prepared for the new cat you adopt you know i don't know how easy it is for uh, people to adopt cats but i know at the san francisco spca we had over 4,000 applicants for do dogs and cats. So, so it's really Excellent. something to think about. And if you're on a waiting list, no better time than to read. So you're <laughs> here. You have the supplies. And we're going to tell you about the supplies, but there are the other things that you're going to find out about the individual personality of your cat. Okay. Well, if we're going with that one, that was excellent start. Of uh, So let's go to the next really kind of basic question. Let's say I go ahead and adopt a cat. Uh, what do I do once I bring it home? I mean, that's a very broad question, but what are some of the first kind of basic things you could do after you bring a cat home? Yeah, I could take that one. So what I would suggest is making sure that you are setting up their environment so that they can be a cat and engage in those normal cat behaviors in ways that we find acceptable as well. So um, a lot of times people think like, oh, all I need is a litter box and a scratching post and some bowls for food and water, and I've got all my bases covered. But cats need lots of stuff to have a really um, enriched environment. And that includes things like places to perch and observe what's going on in the house, places where they can hide if they're feeling a little bit nervous. And then we want things like, you know, ways to make their, their meal times a little bit more interactive, such as food puzzles, so that they're not just, you know, eating their meals out of a bowl and then spending the rest of their day being bored. Yeah, and I have a, just a quick saying, hunting, chewing, scratching, and viewing. <laughs> if you can meet those basics, outlets that they can mimic hunting, um, appropriate 
items, cat safe grasses and plants for them to chew, um, scratching posts so it's not your carpet or not your couch. So think about vertical options as well as horizontal options close to where they spend time and rest. And then viewing, cats love to perch. They love to see being um, up high and on the periphery of the room is their favorite spot. So making sure you've got, um, whether it's actual cat furniture or you know, beautifully designed, doesn't really look like cat furniture because nobody wants that ugly cat tree in the middle of every room, right? So lots of cool stuff out there um, or uh, lots of DIY stuff you can do that, so. That's excellent. And I have a feeling just based off the questions I kind of already seeing that we're receiving in addition to the previous ones, we're gonna see some really strong patterns here. And uh, some of them are about kind of scratching repeatedly and meowing repeatedly. So we'll get to those just so anyone who submitted that, you are not alone and we are seeing a lot of this. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about really quickly another basic one. Are there any benefits to getting an older cat rather than a kitten? Sure, I'll take that. Like, I love having older cats around. You know, the, you've gotten out of the crazy kitten phase where they're jumping on you in the middle of the night, <laughs> they're pouncing on your face or scratching your ankles while you're walking down the hall. Usually older cats are a little bit more subtle. They have a more established personality and they are energy wise you know they can still be pretty energetic but not as high strung as the younger kittens so and they are great companions you know they are the type of cats that at that point in their life they just want to be loved they want attention they want their, their demand for play is a little bit more reduced uh, but don't get me wrong my siamese was active until she was 15 years old so <laughs> that's a great answer Okay, two more basics here. How has the pandemic affected cats, if it indeed has, now that a lot of people are working from home and are constantly interacting with their feline friends? Have we seen any kind of issues or is it more so the humans just realizing what it's like to be with a cat all day? No, I, I definitely think it affects our cats. I mean, cats are very sensitive to change. And even if we might feel like that change should be welcome, that, hey, they get to see us more, they get more attention, more play time, um, the fact that it's a change can be stressful for them at times. And I think if you especially have a cat that's used to a reprieve, you know, for eight hours of the day when we're at work in school and suddenly they are the center of our lives and our outlet for affection and social when we're being socially isolated and now we're using our cat for our, um, our social interactions, sometimes that can get a little old, particularly in households with children. So I've got a four and six year old girl and when school shut down, my pets became the center of their attention and world. And, you know, for a while, it's just this look like, come on, give me a break. <laughs> so um, I, I think it's been hard on, on both dogs and, and cats, just being the center of that attention and having and that sudden change. And, you know, cats, especially adult cats, they, they nap a lot. They want their private space. So, you know, I tell everybody, make, make sure you've got your kitty mm -hmm. spa or your doggy spa. That's right. sort of their haven that nobody enters. No cats, no dogs, no adults even. It's their choice. If they want to just have a break, they can. If they want to join the family, and we'll respect those wishes. Yeah. And related, actually, and I'm actually seeing this in the in the Q and A too. And our audience, you can't actually see the Q and A. That that is how we set it up. So if you've submitted a question, it says you we do have it. But um, we're trying to pull out the kind of patterns that we're seeing in questions. And actually, one or two are similar to the next question we already had which is as some of us start heading back to offices or to work more out of the home, is there anything we should do to make this transition smoother for our cats? I mean, people are concerned, the opposite question, right? What, what are, how are the cats going to do once we start going back and how can you make that transition better for them? Well, I think as Dr. Heron already shared, you know, cats really thrive with routine and changes in routine can be quite disruptive. So what we want to do is we want to make those changes as gradually as possible. So rather than going from 24 seven contact to back to eight to 10 hours out of the house every day, we maybe want to start introducing some shorter t absences or, um, you know, time away from the house to reacclimate to the cat to the fact that, you know what, sometimes you're just not around. Um, I think it also helps if we then give them something that can entertain them in our absence, such as a toy, you know, that they can play with on their own or, you know, some cats actually really enjoy watching TV. So if you don't have a good perch at a window or your window doesn't really look out at anything entertaining, sometimes turning on cat TV can be a really um, good form of entertainment for them. That's really, really smart and helpful. So again, actually, last kind of very general question that we have then, and I'm seeing some of these as well. 
this is kind of cat 101 basic question. I mean, cats have a reputation among certain people, especially for being mean, right? <laughs> or at least humans project that they're mean. And uh, we have a couple questions about, you know, cats that maybe aren't as affectionate as people would like. And then also not just affectionate, but genuinely like a little more aggressive than perhaps they've seen their other friends' cats be. Um, so I guess one of our questions is, you know, what is, what would you recommend for people who maybe actually do have slightly more assertive cats or how can people help work with that if that is who is in their household with them? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's probably 10 questions in one question because uh, yeah. I think <laughs> what we want to do, our job is to figure out why is that cat being aggressive in the first place? Because as our chapter do cats mean to be mean talks about, and there's plenty of different reasons why cats might growl, hiss, bite, or scratch at a, at a human. Um, and a lot of those are different than what we might think. Like they actually aren't being mean. A lot of times cat, one of the number one reason we're gonna see cats be aggressive is because they are afraid. Well, a lot of people don't realize a hiss, when your cat hisses at you or at your child or your visitor or whatever it is they see out the window, that means nothing else and I'm afraid. I'm afraid of whatever that is and this is my signal to back off because that scares me. And so if cats are afraid, then we need to try to engage in things that help them be less afraid and work on being more positive and associating whatever that target is or that trigger that's causing the fear to be something more positive. Things that trigger positive emotions for a cat tend to be food and play with toys. Right, petting. I don't. So petting might be really positive for some cats that really know someone really well. But for a cat who's worried about a stranger, that hand reaching for them and that touch is sort of an invasion. It'd be like meeting someone for the first time and they just took their hands down your face. And say, Hi, how are you? This is how I show my friendliness. That'd be weird, awkward, and you might hiss and bite them too. <laughs> Definitely. Um, but I don't know if Kelly or Milani will take on some of the other motivations for aggression. But I would just be cautious to think about step back, why is the cat showing this aggression? Because the motivation matters and how you um, effectively change that is gonna be different. Part of it is what we don't cover a lot. What people don't realize is, you know, a lot of attention is spent on puppy socialization. We don't, the cats don't get a lot of press regarding kitten socializations. These are classes that you can bring your kitten to, to play with other kittens, to interact with other people, so that they can get used to them at a very young age, get used to handling, so that we can help reduce some of their fears. Right now, there's not a lot of live classes, as you know. Uh, at the SPCA, we do have online kitten classes, so you can enroll and go through the program. But kind of like what Dr. Uh, Heron talked about, there are a lot of fears and people don't really know how to communicate with their cats. So it's really important that we understand them and also give them outlets for appropriate cat behavior. So it's really important that we provide their needs and make sure we understand why are they getting upset. Is it truly aggression or maybe they're trying to play, but their kind of play is not what we want. Yeah. And I would add too, if it's, um, especially if it's been a sudden change in behavior, or if all of a sudden the cat is acting more intensely aggressive than it ever has before, we also want to make sure we get that cat into the vet and get them checked to make sure that they don't have any sort of other medical conditions that might be going on that could be making them feel more irritable or making them feel more uncomfortable during interactions. You know, things like arthritis affect cats. They have, you know, can get a whole host of medical issues that can make them feel more agitated or uncomfortable. So getting them checked by a vet if there's been a change in behavior is very important. I think that's such a great point. I mean, think of how irritable we all are, what a short fuse we might have. Like my back is killing me right now and I am just so cranky with my kids and my husband. <laughs> I just have no tolerance for just the slightest thing and our, our cats are gonna be the same way. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And I, I do think that actually helped answer several questions that, that we were getting in. Okay, so we're 20 minutes in and we're going to move to the previously submitted questions that we actually did get from hopefully some audience members here today. And uh, to everyone in the Q&A who has sent a question, I'm going to comment when we think that we've seen something that sounds like yours too or touches on a similar topic. So let's start first and foremost with Norma in California. I don't know if you're Norma, but uh, Norma's asking about licking and uh, how do I stop the incessant licking? Uh, apparently she's concerned that the cat is licking the skin from her hind legs and she's tried calming treats, 
homeopathic drops, but she hates them, adding flax oil to the dry salmon kibble. She moistens with water, but she doesn't have any other ideas outside that. Cats do spend a fair amount of time grooming. You know, that's something they need to do. So you need to really determine, you know, are we doing normal cat licking or are we particularly focusing on an area of the body? So when I have a, a cat that does a normal grooming, but is spending a lot of time on one particular part of the bar, body, then I do really need recommend taking that cat in to have the veterinarian examine the cat. This could be a sign of an underlying medical problem. Things like um, fleas can cause itchiness and how the cats deal with itchiness is not just scratching, but incessant licking. They can also have food related allergies or inhalant allergies that contribute to licking. And once you reel out the medical problems, then we can talk about maybe behavioral problems that contribute to excessive licking. We've got a great chapter in our book called Oral Obsessions that talks all about excessive licking, chewing, ingestive behaviors, there you go, um, because it's a whole chapter dedicated to it because this is an, a common problem. And there was a study done by one of our, our colleagues, um, Dr. Gary Landsberg, where he found over 70% of um, dogs and cats that had these lick skin problems where they were self-licking and causing hair loss had some medical reason to do so, like Dr. Sung mm -hmm. mentioned, whether it's allergies, and with fleas, we aren't suggesting your house is infested with fleas by any means, but some cats are so sensitive that one single flea bite can cause a major allergic reaction. And because they're so heavily furred, you can't always see that they're having a skin reaction. You don't necessarily have to see a lesion or redness, it's just the hair loss. And what your vet can do is take little samples and look under a microscope to see what might be at root of that, that problem. Mm -hmm. Can we actually, re really quickly, one last thing on this topic. Uh, someone just submitted the question that their cat licks metal objects. It, 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 does anyone know if this is <laughs> related to anything objectively? Any thoughts? Metal objects, you, you said? Yes. So this could be, uh, it could be a weird preference, like, oh, I like the taste of metal. Um, <laughs> that, could, that could be one option. The other option, following up on, on what Dr. Heron mentioned too, is that there has been stud some, a study done by Dr. Frank um, regarding licking inanimate objects, licking something other than themselves. And that usually in that study, a large percentage of those animals in that study had underlying um, GI gastrointestinal problems. So there is a medical uh, problem contributing to that licking of inanimate objects. So if you, if you have a cat that licks you know, metal, that's something to really talk to your veterinarian about and see if you, there's additional diagnostic tests that we can pursue. And sometimes it's as simple as a diet change or maybe mm -hmm. you know a little bit of pepsin here and there your vet will will talk to you about ways to tell because it's funny cats don't have to be vomiting actively to have right. gastrointestinal discomfort so it may not always be obvious and sometimes it's just these weird little behaviors that are the signal that there's something going on on the inside yeah. fascinating and someone just sent, mentioned plastic too so potentially yep. just inanimate objects in general great but thank you so much that is fascinating wonderful to know and I would say with, with plastic, I think there are, I have had patients where we, there's just a preference. You know, cat, like I said, hunting, chewing, <laughs> scratching, viewing. Chewing is a normal natural behavior that they love to engage in. And sometimes there is a preference for certain um, textures. And if plastic is one of those, you have to be careful because clearly that can be dangerous if they start ingesting or eating the wrong kind of plastic. But there are cat safe toys made of that texture that they may be able to supplement with. Um, if indeed a medical reason for that has been ruled out. That's really, really useful. Thank you. All right, we're going to go into maybe what literally one fourth of all these questions is about now, which is about <laughs> fluids, and it is cats peeing, pooping <laughs> as a litter box or not as a litter box. And uh, obviously, I mean, this is a huge amount of our questions. So let, I guess let's try to be as thorough as possible here, even though they, there's many reasons, of course, for why they might do these things. So let's start with Denise who uh, submitted this earlier. Denise on bodily fluids. Four days ago, I adopted a three-year-old cat from a shelter. She's sweet and mellow and seems to be getting used to me. However, again, this is a kitten, it appears. 
Um, sometimes, oh, a three-year-old, never mind, not a kitten, three years old. She's sweet and mellow and seems to be getting used to me. However, sometimes she uses her litter box and sometimes she uses the bathtub. Ugh, I'm afraid she has or will do again elsewhere in my car for the department. Why is she doing this and how can I get her to stop? And similar questions are obviously people just asking why, why are they doing this in your entrances specifically, like specific areas of the home? How can we train them? better especially if they're not kittens etc so please take it away because this is obviously a huge anyone who's owned cats know this is a this is a big one how much time do we have do we have no, no. <laughs> Dave, of just answering the question well i'll start by just talking about general recommendations the basics you need to provide your cats the basic mm -hmm. Uh, a litter box, right? Typically cats like the bigger the better. The general recommendation is one and a half the length of a cat, which a lot of the commercial litter boxes out there are not that big. So it's something that is important um, to provide them. You need to provide them with appropriate substrate. And if your cat doesn't seem to be consistently using that litter, you may wanna consider offering a litter trial, giving them another option of the substrate they might have a different preference. Uh, so those are things that are important. Cleaning the litter box, right? Cats primarily like clean litter box. So don't make it, don't scoop out just once a week, but think about doing it daily, if not twice a day, and making sure the cat has the appropriate um, and clean environment that it prefers. You know, I always equate it like, you know, I would rather go to the bathroom in my bathroom than go to the bathroom in a, a porta potty when it's kind of filthy, right? Um, and I also want to talk about, you know, they need to make sure that the size is appropriate. If you have a big cat and you have a tiny little box, your cat's going to have a hard time fitting in. And then that bathtub's going to look really appealing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a deluxe yeah, bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> and so this, this I just want to say that this optimal litter box environment, um, we could talk for hours on it, but our chapter, so chapter eight is dedicated solely to feline elimination problems. And we talk about what's normal for a cat what their natural preferences are and how to create an environment that allows them to, to utilize that. So that the litter box is the most appealing bathroom in your household. Um, but I think whenever we as veterinary behaviors are presented with a cat that's eliminating outside box, the first thing we're thinking is what's wrong medically. So I know you've just adopted this cat, but it is an adult. I would, I would have a trip to your vet if you don't have that scheduled already and make sure they do a test of your cat's urine and a full physical examination to make sure there's not a reason. So cats that either have pain when going to the bathroom or have an increase in urgency, meaning there's something going on with their body that's causing them to drink more and pee more. And maybe your cat had gone three times in the litter box already and because you haven't had a chance to scoop it yet, she said, you know what, that bathroom is clean. It all goes down the drain, it's nice and big and it makes it, it, it appealing. And so definitely getting that checked out as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and then I would add to it, we wanna make sure that the location of the box isn't a good place for the cat. Cause sometimes cats will decide to find other places because the litter box isn't easily accessible to them. So not only do they need a big box that they can move around in, they need to be able to actually get to that box really easily. So if you have like a two or a three story home and you put the litter box in the basement, which makes a lot of sense, right? Nobody wants a litter box in their living room, but if it takes a, like, it's a really long ways for the cat to get and it's really far away from where they usually hang out, they might choose a more easily accessible locations such as that bathtub that's right down the hall. And I heard you mention in your question, um, Angela, was why are there certain locations or why is it doorways? And mm -hmm. so as, again, as veterinary behaviorists, our first step is to making sure this isn't the medical reason. There's not a cause for pain or discomfort or increased um, elimination urgency. Um, you'd have to say, okay, now is this cat, what's motivating this cat to go outside the outside the litter box? Is it because they are toileting, they're simply using a more appealing bathroom, or are they actually doing something we call marking or spraying, where they're leaving a message? That's very different. So when cats are marking, they are trying to communicate to any other cat who cares to smell, <laughs> um, hey, this is how I'm feeling today. Um, and marking is normal in sexually intact cats. So if you have a Tom or a queen, it's gonna be normal for them to mark. Because they've gotta send out those messages, sexual messages, to the other males and females around, you know, here's my digits, here's my stats. Um, so that's very normal. But assuming your cat coming from a shelter is probably spayed, um, she may be signaling otherwise. And 
just because a cat is squatting does not necessarily mean it, it's toileting. Cats can still mark by squatting. I think some of the ways to tell the difference is the social relevance of the where the cat is if it's going to the bathroom. So if it's near doorways where or windows where they might see a lot of outdoor cats, they could be marking as a stress signal or a territorial signal to the other cats that are outside. Um, if it's on certain a certain article of clothing, like one person in the household, all of their stuff is getting peed on. <laughs> their shoes, their dirty clothes, their pillows. It may be that there's a relationship. Either they're too closely bonded to that person or they've had some maybe negative um, or frightening interactions with that person. And so when they have encounters with that scent, it makes them stressed out and they pee on it. Either because they're stressed because they miss them so much, because we can see this happen with separation anxiety, or they're stressed because, oh, that smell makes me think of that person that maybe had a bad interaction with me and that makes me want to leave a message on it. And one telltale behavior that cats will do um, when they are toileting and not marking is they will do these digging and covering behaviors. So if your cat's in the bathroom doing this on the sides, that's the toileting behavior. If a cat's leaving a little bit of pee and then walking away without caring to cover it up, he's probably trying to leave a message there. That's really, really, that's really useful. I hope that was helpful for so many people who were asking that. Um, and so we have over a hundred questions right now. <laughs> we to get through, the book. But actually, uh, again, kind of the uh, most predominant. And really, again, if, if they are highly medical, I would like us to try to get to the, like, really just help make sure people are getting the help they need as well. Mm -hmm. um, so let's ask this one really quickly which I see has been, a, again, a, a pattern, um, just yowling, incessant meowing, incessant yowling. Uh, we have questions about this from people who just have a cat and they don't know why they started doing it. Obviously, that'd be a different reason as someone who uh, has an older cat who has started doing it recently. Mm -hmm. um, people are saying, obviously, they have fresh food, water, they leave on the faucet from to get water, but this cat, these cats will not stop. And some people are even saying it's, it's actually getting difficult for their own well-being because the cats are so loud and, and just creating noise nonstop. So again, this is kind of similar to the bodily fluids issue, but uh, right. please feel free you know, to speak of in your area of expertise. Well, and I think it's similar to that issue too, where like we could probably spend two hours talking about this because there can be so many different causes for a cat to vocalize a lot or what we might think is excessive, you know, from medical issues, especially if it's an older cat, if it's a sudden change in behavior, we really would recommend getting that cat into your veterinarian to get evaluated because there are lots of diseases, even things like high blood pressure or um, hyperthyroidism, which is excessive um, release of the thyroid hormone that can cause things like yowling. Um, but sometimes cats will also learn to yowl because it results in an interaction or something else that the cat wants. You know, I know I had a cat, um, my, my very favorite cat, he was very talkative, um, but he used to yowl consistently starting at like 3 or 4 a.m. And that was usually because he was starting to get hungry at that time and he was ready to eat. Um, so we really had to figure out ways that we could provide him food at other times and that it wasn't associated with wake up time. Um, so Megan and Weilani, I'm sure you have lots more to add about yelling too, but. Yeah. Especially if you have a Siamese. <laughs> <laughs> My Siamese didn't yell that much, but you know, following up, up with what Dr. Valentine uh, recommended and, and pointed out that cats can yowl for many different reasons. So definitely need to rule out underlying medical issues, making sure you meet their behavioral needs. Remember, cats are are hunters, right? They spend anywhere between like 45 to 60% of their day hunting for food if they have the opportunity. And what do our cats have? The life of Riley. We give them like a feeding trough and they suck their face. And so we need to give them something to do, make them work for their food. If they are hungry, we need to make sure maybe we feed them a midnight snack before we go to bed or we have a time feeder that will open up, you know, at three o'clock and we want to time it before they start yowling, right? And we want to make sure we are not inadvertently, oh, you're yowling, we're talking to you and reinforcing that. Because what people don't realize is certain, certain vocalizations, that meowing in particular, cats tend to do it more towards people than they do towards each other. That's very people-specific communication. In the wild, there's very limited 
a research that has shown that cats actually meow at each other. They meow at us. So they learn to do that. It's something that people has fostered. So yeah, yowling is, is uh, something that we could reinforce inadvertently, or it could be an underlying sign of need um, or a medical issue. Yeah, particularly if it's a sudden change, mm -hmm. right? And maybe your cat's just telling you to go back to work, get out of this house, <laughs> give me a break. Mine does sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, it's something to think about. You need to think about giving your cat some space and giving it nap time. You want a nap time? They want a nap time. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I think we're, we're looking at about 10 to 15 minutes more here. So we'll try to make sure we get the salient points that everyone seems to be asking and then touch on some medical ones too. So this is a pretty common question we're seeing too and is actually previously submitted this is uh, on cat dynamics between cats and between pets. And so we'll take us from Fred uh, with a new cat in the house. I'm wondering if there are clicker training exercises that you can use to help address aggression towards people and other cats. One of our cats has strong aggression towards me and has become more withdrawn since we got a new cat. I've been working on clicker training, some tricks and effort to bond with him and increase his confidence. I'm wondering if there's anything in particular that could work on uh, what would be more directly to address his aggression and difficulty with the new cat. Um, in the first session, less than 10 minutes, he already figured out uh, to sit in high five. <laughs> I've been hoping this will help us bond and feel more secure at his place and in our hearts. I'm, I'm not sure. And this really does relate to a lot of questions we're seeing about, I guess, just general, not that we can really do that, but advice on cats who've had a new cat introduced into the house cats that have a new pet that's not a cat introduced perhaps uh, that are acting out. And also actually several questions about um, cat grief and it, how to deal with a cat who has lost a litter mate, you know, a, a fellow cat in the house is no longer there, or even people, uh, their humans who are in the house who, who may have passed on and, and how if they're suffering from grief there. So I guess a couple of questions here really, you know, how to, how to work with cat aggression with new introduction of new animals in the house, then also the kind of, you know, loss of their object uh, permanence that what they thought was, you know, the regular playmates or their regular fellow cats or even humans in the house too. I can start with the first part. So first of all, kudos to Fred for yeah. clicker training. I mean, that is great. I feel like that is such a novel concept to most of my clients when I suggest it. What? You're going to train a cat? Cats don't want to work. They don't, they, they're not going to, they're not trainable. Oh, they're so trainable. Um, <laughs> and like as Fred has demonstrated, learning how to sit and high five already. You just got to find what motivates them. So first of all, kudos to you, Fred. And, and for also for recognizing that bringing in that new cat in the household um, is causing a little stress on your resident kitty. And that is common. So what we find for people who are wanting to be a multi-cat household um, most successful um, cats that get along well tend to be when they're introduced when they're young um, or even if they're adopted as litter mates. So we have a lot of research showing that. That's not to say that we can't successfully introduce new cats, but it really depends on the previous social repertoire of the resident cat. Has that cat lived with cats before? Did it get socialized to lots of other cats or kittens as a, at a young age or were they taken away from mom and litter mates at you know, six weeks of age and never saw another cat again? Sometimes it's really tough for those cats to share space and resources. Just like some people, some of us love, we can live in that crowded fret house with 10 other people and others are like, no, I want my own room, my own house, shut up. It's just, it's, it's various personalities. And in some cases, Fred, it is a square peg in a round hole and some cats don't want to share space. But a lot of times it is, and it's just about that introduction period. And so if you, so first of all, for those of you considering introducing, I always say if, you're, if it feels like you're going too slow, you're probably going at the right pace. And so what I typically recommend is making the newcomer's world very small at first. So choosing a room, um, whether it's a laundry room, uh, ideally a bedroom where all of the needs for that new cat are met. So food, water, um, perches, like I said, <laughs> hunting, chewing, scratching, viewing, all of those um, needs are met for them. And then you're also spending time with them. But before they know what other world is out there, they don't know what they're missing. And so it allows that resident cat to have a slow introduction. And we typically talk about doing scent exchange first. So I can't see you. Um, I can't um, be in contact with you, but I can smell you. So we will have, if you take some cotton gloves and you rub along the cheeks and the body of your cat, and then you set them 
So the other cats can smell them and they do the same thing. I, I don't recommend going back and forth right away because sometimes that's really offensive for the resident cat to be rubbed with the smell of another cat, but at least showing them, hey, here's a scent and maybe putting out some delicious treats or playing with toys. So there's a positive emotion associated first with that scent. And as long as the two cats that are smelling each other's scent are not hissing or getting really freaked out every time they smell it, they're eating the treats and acting comfortable, then we can start moving to you know, some positive interactions on the other side of that door. Um, and it really depends how the cats are taking it. If they're both sort of curious and meowing and wanting to be close to that door, we could probably go a little faster. But if you're seeing a little bit of hesitance, then sometimes I'll have a rolled up towel or a draft protector even under that door, but I'll start feeding the cats. Like I love to smear like chicken baby food or a little bit of tuna with tuna juice on two plates on either sides of that closed door and let them have this wonderful session of this delicious treat and each other sort of scent presence. And then over time, we'll remove the draft protector, we'll get those plates closer and closer to the opposite side of that door. So every day they have this special moment where they enjoy this wonderful sort of um, snack, I guess you could say, in the presence of each other's scent. So they're already having a good association. And if that's going well, then we can start to introduce a little bit of visual um, introduction. So I can't get to you, I can't touch you, but I can see you. And when we do that, we either will get a hook and eye or we'll have a, a door stop. You don't want to just crack the door because that one cat can bust right in or out and ruin everything for you. So you want to make sure there's not a way for that, that cat to bust through. So just a little bit of visual access. And then we move those plates further away so they don't have to be right next to each other. And over time, we do that fun activity together, getting a little closer. And then we can increase the amount that they see each other by either putting up, I'd say two or three baby gates. <laughs> um, so they can't see each other and you can control how much they see by draping a towel over it. So they just see a little bit and over time can see more and more of each other until you get to the point where they're licking their food off their plate. They can be on either side of that baby gate and they're showing, you know, curious body language. And we talk about cat body language in chapter one, the language of meow. Meow, I won't go too much into that now, but again, no hissing, calm body language, happy to see each other. Then we can do some supervised time where they're licking their plates in the same room and eventually spending some time together. And, and in between those sessions, that door is closed, they're, they're not seeing each other. And if you're doing multiple sessions a day, this will go faster, um, but you can only proceed as, at the rate that your cat will allow. And so if your cat is being hesitant, your cat is hissing, your cat is not so sure, you just have to stay at that slow pace. Um, but some cats will whip through this very quickly and show a lot of positive interest. Um, but there actually was a study published, I believe it was Dr. Emily Levine, that showed that um, cats, the likelihood of, like, if we have two cats presenting to us that are fighting with each other, the likelihood of their living in harmony is greatly dependent on how they were introduced. And if it did not go well when they were introduced, they have a much lower likelihood of getting along later. Um, but again, it it's, depends on the cat, because you can go through all of this, and your resident cat still may say, nope, I just want to live alone. That doesn't mean you have to get rid of the new cat, right? There are ways, depending on you know the size and the um, layout of your household, that you can give a safe haven to one cat on one side of the house, a safe haven to the other on the other side, and they can sort of rotate when they have times out um, with each other. And, and there are plenty of cats that live that way, and they do it very harmoniously. They're just not forced to be together. But again, kudos to you on the clicker training. Keep it up. <laughs> it's just a, it's a nice confidence builder. It's nice to give your cat that one-on-one -on -one social time with you. Um, and that mental stimulation is going to go a long way as well. Um, do you also, similar to that, have any, I guess, thoughts on uh, senior cats suddenly starting to act out this way? I mean, let's just assume that the human uh, haven't changed anything in their lives and the environment hasn't changed drastically. Um, we're getting a couple questions about senior cats starting to act aggressively towards their fellow a housemate's cat or fellow animals in their house when they weren't doing that before. Mm. So if we could have thoughts on that just really quickly, I guess. Well, I would say, you know, which is a common theme throughout this discussion is make sure you get them checked by your veterinarian because a sudden change in behavior in a household where these cats previously got along well is a really big red flag that there's uh, potentially a medical issue going on. You know, it could be arthritis. Um, cats can also develop um, something called cognitive dysfunction, which is very similar to Alzheimer's disease. We also have a chapter on that in this book, um, Aging Cats. So um, it covers that in a lot of detail, um, but definitely get that cat checked um, by a veterinarian. And you might need to get the other cat checked too, because you know maybe the, the cat that it's reacting aggressively to is actually the one who's ill. 
I think that's a good point. I think often, so many times I have someone bring two cats to me that are fighting and they are blaming the mean cat, the bad cat. That's the cat that's hissing and growling and toughing up. When in reality, it was the other cat that was more the perpetrator. They're just doing a lot of silent staring, silent intimidation that we as people do not recognize. And that other cat is just showing a big display of fearful behavior, hissing, swatting, you know, freaking out, all being triggered by the instigator. And often people, that goes completely unrecognized. In our modern age, it's really important that, you know, take advantage of all the webcams uh, available and set yes. up a webcam, right? Record it because it might happen when you're not around. Cats might behave differently when the owners are home or in that room when they're not in that room. So it's really important to pick up some of the subtle behaviors and subtle cues that we are missing and um, talk to your veterinarian about underlying medical problems. And then you can come see us about behavior issues. Yeah. In, in terms, you make a really good point about the webcams, too. I remember I had a case a few years back where I was presented with a cat for peeing outside of the litter box, and the owner swore, it is this cat. This is the cat that's doing it. And I was like, okay, let's set up some cameras. Let's just see, make sure who's doing it. Well, they had six cats in their house, and five out of the six cats were peeing outside of the <laughs> litter box. So webcams are just super valuable. <laughs> so true. All right, so we have about 13 minutes left total, so I think we're going to probably focus on just two or three more areas. You three are doing an incredible job uh, <laughs> with a lightning round <laughs> discussion. Um, I just want to say to everyone who's, whose question if it does not get answered, uh, may, a big one we're probably just not going to be able to get to really is just your cat being more affectionate in general. We kind of touched on it earlier. Obviously, uh, that's... A, we, they, these are authors of a book called Decoding Your Cat, so we highly do recommend that because it's probably very individualized. And so um, we're going to do about two or three more, and then we, we do have to wrap up, but you, you're all doing incredible. These questions are wonderful, so thank you to everyone submitting these. So the, a large uh, area we're seeing, obviously, let's just get to it, is food and picky eaters. And of course, again, anyone who's owned cats, vomiting. So could we hear about uh, maybe the first topic's even easier you know how much vomiting for a cat is actually normal if at all and then uh any advice for cats that who knows why they just will not eat their food you know <laughs> uh and if it doesn't seem that they have any health issues they just have to be escorted to their bowl to eat every day they must have the human escort them or they have to have the yogurt on the food etc so uh, whoever would like to speak to either one of those um, stomach issues or eating. Well, I would <laughs> want to just say a few words about vomiting is that we associate mm -hmm. vomiting as a normal thing for cats. And typically I would say, what is the cat vomiting up, right? If it's vomiting up hairballs, that's understandable. But if your cat is vomiting like every single day, several times a week, that is, for me, there must be an underlying medical concern, right? Cats don't typically just, hey, I'm gonna vomit right now and decide they're gonna voluntarily do it. Usually it's some kind of irritant from, you know, like, like I said, eating grass or licking enough fur that they get hairballs in their stomach and it irritates the stomach. So they're vomiting to me and you need to look at the vomitus and that's not very pleasant, but you kind of need to look, is there a hairball in there? If there's not a hairball, what is in there? Because sometimes people might be surprised. It's, oh, a piece of their toy. They're eating that toy. Oh, it's a piece of my curtain, right? If, if that's irritating them, they're going to vomit. So that's something that's really important um, to, to check out. And also keep in mind, like a cat's natural diet is very different than what we are feeding them in a kibble. Um, they're obligate carnivores. They have a high need for protein. And I think when you have, I mean, I mean clearly I recommend commercially manufactured um, food. I think trying to home cook for a cat can be very complicated. And um, there are websites with resources that you need certain, um, you know, uh, minerals and vitamins if you're going to do that. But every cat's digestive system is a little different. And some are going to have dietary indiscretions and sensitivities that are going to be different than others. Um, we also recognize something called sickness behaviors. So there is actually a difference between vomiting and regurgitation to get into the gross nitty gritty. Um, but vomiting tends to have something that was in their stomach like a hairball and it's associated with foam and sometimes has a yellow tinge, which is bile coming from down their small intestine. Um, so regurgitation is simply, it just looks like a tube of food that they chewed, swallowed, and it came right back up. 
Um, and if that's happening excessively, um, I would be suspicious either of an underlying gastrointestinal disorder or maybe a food sensitivity. Or in some cases, it's a stress signal. So if your vet has ruled all of that out and your cat is still regurgitating, it's sometimes a sign um, that environmentally they're, they're stressed or that the environment is not meeting their natural needs. And so we have found that really supplementing their life with extraordinary enrichment opportunities, which uh, the Feline Dream Home, Chapter 3, <laughs> um, really talks a lot about can greatly reduce some of that regurgitation if it has indeed been ruled out as a medical problem by your veterinarian. And Megan, I'm really glad you brought up the sickness behaviors too, because I think, you know, in that study that was done at Ohio State, where they kind of like investigated some of these sickness behaviors, I mean, it, we're thinking about stress, but sometimes the stress can be as mild as just changing the routine. In that study, like sometimes they just like skipped a play session or turned the lights on at a different time. And that was enough to initiate the regurgitation in some of the cats. So um, it doesn't have to be like a catastrophic stressor, like everybody staying home all of a sudden for 24 seven. Like it can be just something as simple as missing a playtime. Excellent. Okay, thank you. And again, you could probably talk about this topic for a very, very long time. So the key always seems to be if it's abnormal, see your vet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that said, we're going to do, I think, two more areas of topics. If we were pointed out, we have about eight more minutes. We actually, I don't know if we touched on uh, the grieving cat question really quickly. Mm -hmm. So do we know if cat behavior is affected by loss of a, a fellow cat or pet in the house and a, and a fellow human? Yes, cats can suffer grief. It, it varies from cat to cat. So. It's just like people can grieve in different ways. Mm -hmm. Some cats might be the overly affectionate cat. Now I need your attention. Now I need to rub on you constantly. Now I need to sit in your lap. Now I need to be in your face while you're eating. Um, those cats are de could definitely be missing the other cat, especially if the only change in their environment is the loss of the, the other housemate. Other cats may retreat in themselves. They may sleep a lot more. They can suffer from depression. So what you would see would be sleeping more, playing less, being less affectionate, withdrawing from the owners and with the daily, the daily household schedule. So, and that sometimes is easily overlooked um, because we don't re realize, oh, since we're so busy with our lives and especially when we used to not work from home, that you know, we would come home and we didn't realize, oh, he didn't come see me or he came and saw me for like two seconds and then he walked away and I got caught up with something and I forgot about it. Nowadays, hopefully people will, will recognize that more easily. But sometimes, you know, if they're a lot more withdrawn, you might not notice that, especially if you have other pets in the household that are occupying your attention. Um, so it's something that you definitely need to keep an eye out. Like yes, cats can suffer from grief and depression. That's really useful, thank you. Okay, we're gonna do two more and then we're gonna sign off, I think. So a, one of the biggest <laughs> repeated areas of concern here is scratching furniture. <laughs> so uh, from Dana and then from many other people here, a similar question. I have two cats when they were six months old, I've had them. They started scratching on our dining room chairs or fill in whatever chair you want here. I have provided multiple other scratching options, a stand post, the cardboard scratch, or the foam mat. But while one of them has chose to use those a lot, the other hasn't. They both have continued to wreck the chairs as well. Uh, it's been almost two years. I, can I ever train them to leave the chairs alone? Is this a lost cause? The scratching questions are countless here today. So thank you for your thoughts. I think it's important to remember that cats have to scratch. Um, they, it's how they uh, shed the outer layers of their nails. So you see they're kind of continuously growing and they have layers to them. And so they need to scratch to be able to shed those outer layers. If you see some older cats with arthritis that don't have the physical ability to scratch, they get these big sort of thick gnarly nails that can grow into the pad, it's really dangerous. And we never want to prohibit cats from scratching because it's, it's necessary. Um, and then they also do that for marking. And it's not just, you're making funny faces. Is everything okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> They're suddenly not, are you not hearing? That's also um, my so they, a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. So they, leave, they want to mark. So they not only do they leave sort of pheromones and scents um, with the glands in their pads, but they want to leave a visual mark. They want other cats to be able to see it from across the room. Like, look, there's a message here. It's like that ding in your inbox tells you you have a message. 
so that the another cat can come investigate sniff and detect both pheromones and scents to say, oh, this is the message you were leaving. So it's, it's sort of like a, a signal, like, come here, listen to my message, you've got mail. <laughs> and so they want, they want substrates, they want material that are easily frayed and that will help shed those outer layers. And so there is something really awesome about those dining room chairs, right? It's the, probably the right height. So they like to be able to stretch. It's mm -hmm. probably in a location that's close to where they spend time. Cats tend to want to wake up from a nap and stretch and scratch. So we've probably got prime location, we've got prime height, and we've got a prime material for shedding those outer layers and for leaving a nice big mess. So what we are then tasked with is how do we find something more appealing than that? So we either say, well, you don't have access to that room, and I have all these wonderful other scratching posts that are similar to what you like. The cats are telling us, I want something of this height, I want something made out of this material, and I want it close to this location. So think about how can I find something else? I mean, I've had people just go to the thrift store and buy another chair. Like, this is just your cat. It's similar to what I have, but it was cheap, and so go ahead and ruin it. <laughs> or think, because the scratching posts, they just may not cut it. And I find a lot of times you go into your average pet store and they're short. They don't have that texture that's going to fray and leave a huge mess. They're just not as appealing. There's also a product out there called Feel a Scratch that might actually be helpful in encouraging cats to scratch in the desired locations. But again, you have to have options that are appealing enough or it won't work. Basically, feel a scratch is something that leaves a scent, so it's a, it mimics a pheromone um, between their paws that says scratch here. It also has a bit of a visual sense that it does leave a mark, so don't put this on something that um, you don't want seen. And then it also has a bit of catnip essence to it, so that cat, there's some studies showing cats might be drawn to want to scratch where there's been catnip. So that can help accelerate the interest in the desired scratching options, but if it's not if it's not matching what what they have and they still have access to that it may not cut it so it's sort of you can make the dining room chairs less appealing there's double-sided tape and things like that if you want that on your dining room you might stick to your chair though when you go to sit down so <laughs> less than appealing for that um, but you know I, I just think of look at the what is it about those chairs that's awesome and how can you create something as similar as possible and accelerate that interest with the feel of scratch product that's great. Wow. Yeah, in our book, we do have a little kind of like a, a tips on how to make your own cat scratcher. So if you have a, a chair, let's say it's velour, right, and your cats just love it, go out to the fabric store, get that similar type of fabric, right? And, you know, there's simple instructions in our book, like how, how can you make your own cat scratcher? Think about the height, the position, right? Some cats like to do the 90 degrees and they like to do the full stretch. Some like to do the 45 degree, some like to do the horizontal. <laughs> Provide it in different options. Put it right next to the, to the chair or sofa you don't want them to scratch. And one of the key things that we always forget, yeah, because we always go, oh, stop scratching, and we yell at our cats for scratching. We never praise them for scratching on their cat scratchers, right? We just take it as a norm. We're like, oh yeah, he's doing his thing, okay. But we never say, good job, buddy, yeah, you go scratch that. <laughs> cat owners where we do the clicker training and we click and we capture that behavior and we tell the cat you're the best cat in the whole world and the cat's like yeah oh you want to see me scratch right <laughs> and i've actually trained cats to scratch on cue you know so we'll call them over and come do a touch and do scratch the cat's scratching and they're so ecstatic because they're getting attention they're getting praise and maybe treats so something we forget is that we need to praise our cats for doing the right thing and not always be obsessed about yelling at them or reprimanding them uh, for doing the wrong thing. We need to provide the, the appropriate materials for them and encourage them to use it, right? Because if your cat's been scratching on an inappropriate item for a long time, they develop a habit. It's something that they, they forget about. They just go and do it. This is my thing, right? And in order to change a habit for a person, it takes eight to 12 weeks. So you gotta be patient, you gotta be pers persistent, okay, and consistent. So Fred, get out your clicker and train that cat to scratch and then make a video and let us see it. <laughs> I hope, could you please let us know? Um, okay, so we are over time, but we're going to do just two more really quickly, if that is okay with the, with the panel here, um, because just from my own personal experience and seeing the quantity here, uh, second to last question. Can anything be done about cats waking you up early or in the middle of the night? Is this just how it is? Is this just what they do? Thoughts? 
Well, I think I, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but I know for my own personal cat, like, so he was waking up yowling early in the morning because he wanted to be fed. So for him, I just figured out different ways to feed him. And I did feed him out of an automated feeder that just opened up and gave him food in the middle of the night. So he was satiated at the time that he would normally wake up and start being hungry. Um, and then I think we also need to make sure that we are giving them enough engagement before we go to bed because you know we've been busy all day even when we're working from home you know we got all these other things that we got to do we might forget about interacting with our cats and then they've just been like bored all day long and maybe just didn't get enough interaction that day so we just need to make sure we schedule some play time time to interact with them before we go to bed um, to make sure we're fulfilling their needs and so it's not if it's not necessarily related to food then and it's biting, let's say, we might also be attention related to before going to bed. Mm -hmm. They're not getting yes. Okay, yeah. that's really interesting. Where have you been all my life? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so our final question today, and thank you again to all of our attendees uh, here today, um, is really, you know, there's kind of a, a legend out there that cats, it's healthier for them to have another cat in the house. And uh, I'm curious if this is medically proven, if from a behavior standpoint, <laughs> This is true. Uh, what what are your thoughts on if it's if it, if it makes a difference for a cat to have a fellow cat? Oh, as any behaviorist will tell you to any question, it all depends. <laughs> depends on the cat. There are some cats that thrive in a social environment that are highly driven to engage and groom and play with other cats, and others that want no part of that sort of social environment. And then probably a lot in the middle that tolerate, right? They are fine, they tolerate each other, they don't necessarily need each other, but they get along with harmony, which is I think what we all hope at minimum to have. Um, and never, I never, for any behavior problem, I never recommend getting a second cat to solve one cat's problem, unless it's a young kitten that is overly playful. Then I do say having that second cat is actually very helpful, um, but that's really literally the only thing I ever say that for. So I get these kittens that are, you know, three, four months old, and they're stalking their people and grabbing onto their ankles and biting them. They're pouncing on them. They're constantly looking for play, 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 play. Probably the best out for that is another kitten. So not another adult cat, but another kitten. It's just why we talk about adopting litter mates, because they, if you watch kittens play, they're nuts. Like they're practicing their hunting skills. They're stalking each other. They're wrestling. They're not, they're biting and scratching at each other, but their, their claws are actually retracted they're not really biting with any pressure it's just all mutual play and it's completely normal and so for a lot of kittens where that drive is really strong they're going to take it out on their people or the dog um, or the children right <laughs> that are walking through quickly because they're so so tempting to chase um, so those are situations where i say it really is helpful and better for the well-being of those kittens if they do have another cat or a kitten um, but that said if that's not an option for you um, we just have to be really on our game on top of our game with lots of at least four sessions uh, a day with that little wand or feather or engaging them in that type of play to wear them out and do it before they ask for it. Because if they put together that, hey, I chased you, I stalked you, I grabbed you, I bit you, and then you got off the toy, their mind puts that together. Oh, in order to get this need met, I need to engage in all these behaviors ahead of time. It's, it's not that they're being evil or bad, it's just consequences, right? The consequence of this behavior was something great for me, so I'm gonna do that behavior again. Um, and so providing those outlets. But for those of you out there who've got a single cat at home and he's doing just fine, I don't think you need to go shopping for another cat unless you're really mm -hmm. personally wanting to be a two cat household, but many cats are doing just fine as, as solitary. And all, again, depends on the social history of that cat and what they were exposed to young and have kind of a good sort of memory in their brain. Cause it can, it can be pretty hard and, and you know, it, it, people ask about multi-cat households, like what, how many cats is too many? You probably got that question, Angela, for all I know. It's, it's, a, it's never too many cats until it's one too many cats. And that could be the second cat and that could be the 12th cat. It's just that one that isn't compatible and creates this whole social tension for the, and throws off the whole di dynamic. But nothing wrong with being a single cat, but if you do want to, kittens are probably the way to go. Well, we are over time, uh, but I would love to hear if you have any parting thoughts uh, during this quarantine time, especially for these attendees, uh, any summaries or kind of mottos for them to take away if you have any for this incredibly fast informative hour. Well, as we talked about, 
cats are smart. They have a lot of individual personality, individual differences and preferences. And as we brought up a couple of times, you know, Fred highlighted it, cats are trainable, right? Cats can learn. It's, it's up to us to teach them, to give them, pro provide them with adequate enrichment and also give them opportunities to learn. If you never train your cat, you don't know what you're missing out. I have a blind cat and my blind cat, when I say touch, will immediately shove his nose up because he's waiting to touch my finger for a treat. So if I can train my blind cat, you guys can train your seeing cats. And I would add, especially in this time of quarantine, but I think that this is just a good general rule of thumb for interacting with any pets, but cats especially, is make sure you're always giving your cat a choice in whether or not to interact with you. You know, they're so soft, they look so you just want to cuddle them and hold them all day long and pet them for hours on end. Um, but sometimes that physical infection isn't always what they're looking for. So it's helpful to always make sure if you want to interact with your cat that you invite them over, encourage them to come to you to interact rather than going over and disrupting them when they're sleeping. And that's going to help build a really healthy, solid relationship if they have some choice. And I would just like to conclude by saying, get a relationship with your veterinarian, right? You've got a cat, you've got a kitten, even if they're not due for shots for several months, make that appointment now. Vets are overrun and busy. So sometimes it's hard to get that appointment when something goes on. So it's best to be an established patient already. Your veterinarian is gonna be a key resource for helping you determine how can we keep, keep this cat happy and healthy for as long as possible. Um, and that, like we said, any, any change in behavior, anything different, go to your vet first. And if you think it's a behavior issue or you're just not sure, well, read our book. We talk about it all. There it is. <laughs> Thank you so much to this incredible expert panel. I, that was a whirlwind. I don't know if anyone else in the audience felt that way. Again, thank you to our audience for being here today for Decoding Your Cat, uh, presented by Bookshop. We have still over 100 questions in the queue that we weren't even able to press as answers. Some of them were answered during us addressing these major points and some of them uh, were not. But if you specifically, again, as all the doctors here said, have any questions about the cats, um, affection with you or uh, aggressive behavior specifically, again, that, that is likely, if it's not you know medical especially, it's probably in decoding your cat out from you <laughs> Bethel and Harcourt. So again, just wanna say our experts, Thank you all so much. Really appreciate your time. And thank you to our audience. You could have been doing a lot of things today and you chose to do this, especially during this very strange year. So thank you. We're going to send a thank you email again with a link to buy the book, Decoding Your Cat. And also keep, uh, stay tuned for news from Bookshop on where this video recording will be. It most likely will be on a YouTube account from Bookshop, but uh, be sure that you check Bookshop's platforms to make sure if you, in case you want to rewatch this or um, <laughs> you want to share it with someone else who might be able to be helped by this and the cats in their life. And again, thank you all again for joining us on behalf of Bookshop where every purchase you make directly supports independent local bookstores. And thank you again to our experts and uh, hope you all join us again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone.